नमस्कार इंसॉल्वेंसी वेटरन्स टॉक शो के एपिसोड सिक्स में आपका हार्दिक स्वागत अभिनंदन टुडे वी हैव ए वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट ऑन द शो हु इज ए पर्सनल फ्रेंड ऑफ माइन आई एम राजेश शर्मा योर होस्ट ऑफ द शो एंड टूडेज गेस्ट इज डॉक्टर बी के सिन्हा हु रिमेन्ड मेंबर इन एन सी एल टी फ्रॉम टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन टिल रिसेंटली ओनली लास्ट टू लास्ट मंथ ही डेमिटेड हिज ऑफिस एज मेंबर एन सी एल टी फ्रॉम एन सी एल टी डेली बिफोर दैट ही वॉज वर्किंग इन एन सी एल टी हैदराबाद डॉक्टर सिन्हा इज ए वेटरन इन द फील्ड ऑफ सिविल सर्विसेज ही इज ए नाइनटीन एटी सेवन बैच इंडियन रेवेन्यू सर्विस इनकम टैक्स ऑफिसर एंड ड्यूरिंग द कोर्स ऑफ हिज आई आर एस टेनियर ही नॉट ओनली सर्व इन इंडिया but abroad and he has versatile experience of dealing different type of matters in the income tax itself both of us took our oath on the same day 4 july 2019 and uh dr sina has adjudicated many cases during his tenure many of them have been upheld by nc lat welcome to the show dr sena welcome namaskar brother rajesh very happy to be here on this talk talk show called insolvency veterans i have been seeing earlier episodes and they have all been very well uh, received by viewers and uh, it is a it is a great, a great niche work that you have started in the area of uh, igc uh, uh brother before we start uh to the main topic of our today's show uh you see uh earlier we were thinking that our show is beneficial for sitting nclt and nclt members students academicians irp and uh, 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 rps liquidators or so on but you see to my sweet surprise i got a few calls from those people who are having career in various fields and who wish to become a member of nclt they are complimenting us that and saying that this show is really beneficial for them who are preparing to become who are aspiring to become mm-hmm. nclt member in future mm-hmm. they may be uh, senior ias officer mm-hmm. uh, senior revenue officer uh, chartered accountant company secretary advocates yes. professionals uh, yeah. judges professionals mm-hmm. and so on and so forth i think our show is getting momentum and people who wish to become nclt member they are also uh, you know inclined to see our shows uh, that is why i said it's it's a niche work that you are doing no other uh, talk shows i have come across until now which is so appropriate for people who are involved with this ibc ecosystem yes actually you know uh, the very purpose of inviting sitting or form, former members of nclt and nclat honorable judges from high court and supreme court is that that we hear from the uh, person who delivered the judgment that what was going on in his mind mm, thought where, process uh, thought that, process that where, led to that judgment yes and uh, when he wrote the judgment judgment is in everybody's hands yes. one can read and uh, you know basically take forward the judgment yes. whatever the uh, 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 written in the but nobody knows the mind of the judge mm. and that is the purpose we kept it uh, no, in this show that's that's really that's really good because it also will uh, 
will provide some food for thought for uh, future members also and sitting members also for uh, all the professionals that are involved in it as to what is the thinking process when a matter under insolvency code is decided and what are the basic standards or parameters that the judges have to keep it in mind yes. and uh, decide things in accordance with those standards. You see, both of us have remained inside and CSD. Mm. And uh, uh, what I have observed is that normally, normally, it's not always true, mm. but normally uh, the members do not discuss cases with each other during the course of service. Mm. Yeah. Yes. They go by their own uh, thinking and yeah. process and uh, pass their judgment. Mm. Of course, they take, take into account the uh, jurisprudence yeah. with respect to that particular issue. Yes. But normally, we do not discuss with mm. each other. Mm. Here, what I find is that it's an opportunity for all of us yes. to come forward and come, discuss. Come on uh, the same page and discuss an issue yes. uh, which will also benefit the viewers. Yes. Yes. Viewers and uh, more so to the sitting members also, yes. they may be knowing that what my brother judge or brother uh, mm. sister judge mm. did during this type of a particular uh, yeah. situation, what was his thought process mm. and how he decided that case, mm. that may become a guideline for ah, others also. At mm. least a starting, a starting point Yes. for further research yes. also, it will become a starting point at least. And yes. knowledge, you know, it is well said that yes. knowledge has no end. No end. The yes. more you spread it, the more you will be gaining it. Right. Yes. Uh, brother, uh, uh, you see, you have remained uh, income tax um, officer, mm. commissioner level. But, uh, your last uh, uh, position was principal commissioner? Principal commissioner. Principal, commissioner. principal commissioner, income tax. And uh, in 2018, you uh, retired. Mm. And after that, you became member. So I thought this is most appropriate area what should be our uh, uh, you know topic of uh, today's discussion although it will not be confined to only that yes. but yes we will be primarily talking on the issue of uh, interplay between the income tax direct taxes that is income mm -hmm. tax mm -hmm. and the ibc yes. and during the resolution and liquidation process mm -hmm. how the uh, direct tax affect the ibc and IBC affect the direct tax. A very dear subject to my heart, being an ex-revenue officer. Yes. And also as a member of NCLT, um, I have always taken the context in which Income Tax Act is to be read. The context of IBC is determined, uh, to my mind, is first from the preamble or the long title of the code and it goes right up to section 238 where the non obscenity clause is involved, included. So where, where whenever we think as to the interplay of any other statute with IBC, we have to keep in mind the preamble as well as section 238. 238 of the IBC. In that context, when we look at the Income Tax Act, uh, the preamble says that among other things like enhancement of value, maximization of value and also um, avail, uh, availing the credit in the market, etc., etc. It also says that it also alters the priority of a statutory debt or a statutory dues. Yes. So it also, the code also alters the, the priorities of statutory dues. You see, earlier uh, and for that purpose, particularly in the context of Income Tax Act, uh, Section 178 of Income Tax Act was amended by the court. It has also amended some other laws. But since we are talking about Income Tax Act today, 178.6 has been amended to actually show that it has no primacy of collection of income tax as it used to have before the code was introduced. So the altering the priority has come also in the statute itself. Yes. Because otherwise 178 subsection 6 used to say that for any tax collection purposes, income tax will have, because it's also start with a non obscenity clause. And it says it will have privacy over other uh, taxes, etc, etc. But by this amendment, it has been, a, a, a carve out has been created to say that other than insolvency cases. Yes. 
brother, uh, that is the set principle in the mm-hmm. uh, jurisprudence that the act which has come later will be prevailing on the uh, yes. act which yes. has come uh, yes. earlier. Yes. So that way also, that IBC also will be prevailing uh, on income uh, tax. Because that section 238, 238 also has a non absentee clause. Yes. And it also says that anything which is inconsistent with IBC, yes. it will override. Yes. So that, that is also one reason. Uh, and Pradha, what I was finding is income tax dues with the companies which are into IBC are huge. Yes. Huge. Yes. And the amount goes on accumulating. Yes. That way. Because the interest, because of interest, interest penal charged, interest and uh, all interest those getting are, charged. Uh-huh. You see, uh, first of all, during the process of resolution, the law says earlier people were having this type of misnomer that you know once a company is admitted into CRP, no other coercive measure can be taken against that company. That is true today also. But you know, in ABG shipyard case, Honorable the then Chief Justice of uh, Supreme Court passed judgment and which is which has become a bible for today's uh, mm. scenario that you know uh, the assessment proceedings will continue during the crp also however no coercive measure will be taken uh, yes uh, what you are saying is uh, correct because uh, 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 the 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 reference is to section 14 moratorium yes the reference is to section 14 of ibc which says that certain acts will be prohibited to be taken and it also includes one of the clauses where it says no assets of the company under IBC can be taken over by any other authority. Now the issue which came up again and again before us was in cases where income tax department has already put garnishi order or even other departments mm-hmm. have already put garnishy order on the accounts of the company, whether they can take that money during the moratorium, whether it is possible. And I have passed orders saying, no, they cannot. They must lift. They must lift that garnishy order then and there because they cannot take over. Once the company has gone under IBC, nothing can be taken from the company until let's say resolution or liquidation, whatever be, whatever the, is, but, yeah. whatever be the result. So in, in those cases, I have passed several orders like saying that uh, these, these, these kinds of garnishy orders or the uh, recovery proceedings have to be lifted. Brother, what is the crux of moratorium? The crux of the moratorium is... To give a calm period. The, the corporate data should not be put at a disadvantageous yes. position yes. during the moratorium yes. till resolution or liquidation yes. uh, is uh, ordered. Uh, and the assets of the uh, corporate data are kept intact. Uh-huh. If by virtue of any statute, the asset has already been taken over by the concerned department, it cannot be brought back. Yes. But, but during the moratorium, no asset can be, can be taken. Uh, taken. taken. That is what the basic yes. principle yes. is. Yes. Uh-huh. And, and coming to the, to the judgment of Honorable Supreme Court about assessment has to be, con- can be continued, mm-hmm. even in Monet's path, mm-hmm. uh, which was, I think, earlier than ABG Shibyan, the same principle was laid down, yes. saying, because, you see, it, there are time-barring limitations in, under Income Tax Act. Those limitations have to be adhered to. Adhered to. Work, uh, so, for making the assessment, mm-hmm. you can't go beyond that limitation date. Mm-hmm. So, assessment can continue, but no demand can be recovered. That is the, the, the basic principle now. Mm-hmm. Until, unless... And second point is, whatever demand that you raise be, can only be treated as a claim. You don't have an overriding claim. No crown debt. It's, it's like a crown debt. Crown debt was always inferior to a secured debt. So this is also a crown debt. So crown debt cannot be overriding the secured debt. But you know, brother, off late, mm. there is a lot of discussion going on with respect to two different uh, judgments passed by Honorable Supreme Court. One, uh, you know, putting the secured government creditor with the other secured creditors and unsecured government creditors with the other unsecured creditors. And second judgment 
in in other judgment on the supreme court another bench has passed an order stating that no the government debt is to be treated in uh, below in, in the 1e e. e. yes you see now everybody is having this thing in mind that what should be done in this regard you know i have also tried to analyze mm-hmm. this thing uh if you start reading 53 first you come with secured creditor then you come with unsecured creditors okay right. secured creditor will be sitting with secured creditor unsecured creditor will be sitting with unsecured creditor and that will be holding good for government secured government dues also like i'll tell you there are few dues in government also which are totally secured and which are having a primary uh, primary uh, charge on the asset of the company even uh, bank came into picture mm. suppose land has been allotted by the government mm. and in the uh, agreement itself it is written if this is not paid that the land belongs to government not belongs to this uh, uh, corporate debtor mm. so what my point is a secured government creditor will sit with secured creditors an unsecured government creditor will sit sit with unsecured creditor the question that that was decided in my humble no. opinion in in rainbow papers yes. papers was that whether a security interest can be created by operation of law because otherwise as, as we understood security security was always created through an, through agree- an agreement agreement and a transaction uh-huh, and a transaction so in that honorable supreme court in that judgment said no no it is not only in that situation that a security is created a security interest can also be created by operation of law and then they read into gujarat vat act and they found out that the act actually provides for creating a security interest but to me brother what i have read may uh, hmm. that in renbo the security interest was already acted upon and the asset was already taken over by the uh, gvat department now you cannot bring it back that yes. is the, that is the case mm. no that's correct once it has been taken over it cannot come back yes it was already taken over the issue was whether they will where will they stand in priority mm. where will they stand in priority but and... my mind is very clear when it is against a transaction yes or against a proper agreement between the two parties i don't think that the intention of the legislator legislator is to you know basically uh, consider a secured government debt as an secured government debt and put it in so where that, it has come from agreement where it has come from a transaction no if there is an agreement the security interest is created its charge is created it is also registered by roc etc etc that is a clear cut case of a security being created but by virtue of having now just I, by virtue will, of operation will, of law it should not be considered as security will, no in case of income tax mm-hmm. i am only talking i am confining myself to income tax mm-hmm. i am saying in view of the very mm-hmm. very very amendment to section 1786 itself mm-hmm. if even, even if there was some security created by virtue of that 1786 earlier mm-hmm. i didn't take it brother i believe you intervened also and you got this amendment done uh where uh, the income tax was continuing to make pass assessment orders and continuing to um, uh, continue to uh, mounting the uh, income tax liability and when it is the re- resolution pl- plan is approved and a particular amount has been you know assigned to income tax department or nothing has been assigned to income tax to reduce that liability from the overall income tax dues uh, uh yes. please throw some that, light on that 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 was a point uh, regarding what happens when a company gets resolved for a value much less than the original debt claimed or admitted by rp etc etc so what happens to the statutory dues in we have seen in in 53 they come uh, much below they come in 53 one year etc etc then we have honorable supreme court's decisions also saying that once the once the resolution plan is approved all the other liabilities which are pre existing gets extinguished etc etc so what happens to that demand which is created by the income tax authorities in assessment and is still outstanding it is a clear cut uh, 
clear cut understanding of law as it prevails today that once a resolution plan or even if a liquidation has happened and whatever the department has got it will not going to it will not get anything any single penny more over and above that yes so what happens to the demand which remains outstanding in the books of of the of the revenue authority it, it needs revision it, uh, it needs modific- revision yes. or modification mm-hmm. so that is why this particular sub, uh, the, the particular section 156 capital a was introduced mm-hmm. where a provi- uh, in income tax where a provision has been introduced to say that wherever on account of resolution an adjudicating authority has reduced the liability mm-hmm. by virtue of the provisions of IBC and mm-hmm. related regulation, the assessing officer will have authority to accordingly modify the outstanding demand. Huh, and make it a, a, bring Mo- it down at to bring, a realistic level uh-huh. so rather to, than, you know. To a, to a realistic uh, level. Yes. And also because, you see, writing off, mm-hmm. etc. under the revenue Revenue acts is not possible. It's very very difficult. It's very difficult. The process is very long. Mm-hmm. It takes a, a, a even for a, a smaller amount for writing off because revenue writing off is a huge decision to be taken. But amending demand is but, a possible this, because of the law because of being the law. amended. Yes. Now it gets amended. Mm-hmm. You see, yes. tomorrow if something else happens and uh, you see uh, some windfall or whatever, like we have got. Uh, 43, 45, uh, 66 mm-hmm. applications pending well resolution plans mm-hmm. do uh, are get, getting approved. And just as an imaginary case, when the money comes back on account of those applications, if being a creditor, also a government creditor, if, if the huge money is coming back and the government also gets something, then once again the demand can be accordingly. Uh, will be uh, because it is only modification it is not writing off yes it's not writing off yes that's fine so it, it can be raised also if it's tomorrow uh, uh, tomorrow uh, it, it will be it will be it will be modified it yes. can be modified but so with respect to resolution and uh, with respect to liquidation hmm. we have discussed the interplay of ibc with uh, income tax uh, dues now let us uh, um, you know switch over there, there was one more point yes. regarding income tax which is very very important from the perspective of the corporate debtors mm-hmm. which are getting resolved is 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 carry forward of losses yes carry forward of losses under the income tax act any company can private company uh, or any company can carry forward business losses up to 8 years and depreciation they can carry forward uh, mm-hmm. indefinitely the issue is with reference to section 79 of the income tax act which puts a prohibition on carry forward of losses if the shareholding pattern has been of the company the... has changed mm. and somebody who was holding more than 51% mm. is now not holding more than 51% meaning change thereby the in, change in shareholding change pattern. in the shareholding pattern mm. now what happens in the resolution case so 100% change. SRA is coming, 100% gets changed. So what happens, whether they will get the benefit of carry forward of losses, particularly private companies, or will they not get it, was the question. Section 79 of Income Tax Act has been accordingly amended to yes. allow this, to get the to give that relief, that in cases of resolution, even though there is 100% change of shareholding, the carry forward losses will be available. As a matter of fact, brother, what I have observed is that many resolution applicants you know, they take due advantage of unabsorbed losses. They, they, they factor it. They, they, factor they have it. to yes, factor it yes, because the yes. company is a fledgling company. Yes, yes. They must factor mm-hmm. what is what is the, what is the, what benefits the the company is bringing to them, mm-hmm. so that they can take over the company and run it mm-hmm. uh, properly. The the only one condition is put in Section seventy nine now mm-hmm. that. We must give a hearing to the principal commissioner of uh, jurisdiction, principal commissioner of income tax. Hmm. Otherwise, uh, that that provision is. Uh, and now the notice given. is to go to him, whether ha, he comes or ha, not. Ha, that ha, is that his outlook. Giving an opportunity outlook. to hear. Yes. 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 And uh, brother, what is the uh, treatment of MAT? MAT. MAT credit. Uh, mm-hmm. One MAT credit. Mm-hmm. MAT credit also. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are two aspects to MAT credit. One is 
calculation of mat itself book profit itself so one relief which has been granted by by bringing a circular by the cbdt is that for calculation of book profits the depreciation and business losses will not be taken into account meaning thereby then the mat calculation of mat itself will be less mm-hmm. secondly the credit will be available okay credit will be available if the company is going as a going concern the credit will be even available. if the shareholding is changed ha it company, is not going haan, to haan. it is not going to it will uh brother uh, our research team has taken few cases yes from the reservoir of many cases adjudicated by you okay. and in one of the case in hyderabad bench you know uh, an interesting question came before the bench stating that since the financial creditor has already taken a recourse against the pledge share of that particular cd uh. which was under this uh, you know adjudication before mm-hmm. you and uh, the uh, cd was taking a plea that since they have already taken a recourse against the pledge share the security available to them and now they have become the shareholders they are the owners of this company mm-hmm. they cannot bring section 7 section 7 against the same company yes. in which they are the shareholders yes, yes, yes. this was the case it was it uh, was can you elaborate uh, uh, that was what a, was going on there and what was, was in a, your mind in uh, deciding that uh, it was a power it was a power company uh, i think minakshi uh, uh, minakshi energy, uh, energy. limited uh, it was a power company and their argument uh, actually you see certain the, the shares of the company themselves were placed with the lenders yes state bank being the mm-hmm. Uh, main lender and other uh, other lenders were there there were two phases of the pla- uh, power plant coming and what happened uh, the when the company defaulted the lenders have actually invoked the pledge mm-hmm. so the argument taken by corporate debtor was since pledge is invoked the debt uh, they have become shareholders of the company and therefore there is no debt now that that is required to be paid our thought process in that uh, case was that yes the shares were pledged to the lenders as a security for the loan until unless those shares even if the pledge is invoked it only gives the lenders a right to hold those shares hold those shares rather than the original shareholders when they, when you invoke the pledge then the original shareholders cannot sell those shares that is what it is but until unless they have realized those shares and realized certain amounts by selling those shares it will not be treated that that the debt is being repaid yes so that is that is the idea of with which we had uh, decided this issue and actually admitted that case the admission was also upheld by honorable and clap The, the i think company has already been resolved there is a resolution plan approved and all that but that to my mind it is very similar to a case where you see you were uh, the the financial creditor was having a recourse against the assets of the company in surface also yes similar surface he has taken uh, the financial creditor has already taken over some assets however the realization from that asset has not been has not happened as as, as yet. yet as yet by virtue of you know that surface action if the corporate debtor takes a plea since he has already taken over my asset where is the question of you know mm. putting a, an ibc case against me uh-huh. however surface is a different act this is a different act yes. and here the main course is uh you know basically to resolve the company rather than recovery yeah, it is not recovery it is not a uh, recovery suit it yes. is a, it is a resolution suit yeah, resolution so um uh, you know i think uh, your decision was absolutely right and it has been taken yes, uh, uh, accepted by yes. nclet also yes. you know in one of the case brother can back factors uh, limited mm. factors case uh, the seller has sold some bill uh, 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 so, some goods to buyer mm. buyer accepted the bills and gave the to the and took the uh, finance from factor mm. can bank factor mm. now can bank factor uh, you know what they did is uh, when they uh, submitted their claim before the buyer 
were uh, defaulted. Mm. Now the question was whether the factor, can back factor, is having recourse against buyer or recourse against seller. Mm. To my mind, basically both of them, uh, the agre- main, main agreement was between seller and the factor, and his recourse is against seller first. Mm. Uh, that is what that is what we mm-hmm. actually decided that matter mm-hmm. and we did some research at that time looked mm-hmm. into the factoring act of 2011 and also looked into the factoring regulations issued by rbi to understand exactly what happens because this was also new to to, to us to understand the whole transaction uh, as a whole and when uh, when one looked into prudential norms mm-hmm. of the rbi regulations on factoring they say that the if the factoring is on recourse basis then the seller of goods will be the debtor will be the debtor they, their name has to be in the books of accounts of the bank as debtors and not of the buyers of the goods because he you are lending money to him to seller not to, to the buyer. to the seller no. there is nothing moving from nothing is moving from factoring bank to the buyer of goods. And they are financial creditor under section 7, no ha, operational creditor under section ha, ha. Yes. And then they cannot be treated as or deemed to be a financial creditor against the buyer of the goods. Absolutely. In any in any case. That is what we have in, in that order we have hastened to, to add this. Hmm. That not only in, in this situation, but in no situation, hmm. you can say that the buyer has become I, I'm a financial creditor to the buyer. There is a, in operational creditors, there is, there is a slight difference. There, an, a, a factor can be an operational creditor mm-hmm. sometimes. Because, but financial creditor to the buyer, they can never, never be. Uh, what will happen if there is a recourse available to the factor against the goods which has been sent and which is lying with the buyer? If the goods are sent, mm-hmm. goods are sent, it, it depends on what is uh, being what is being uh, agreed between mm-hmm. parties. Yes. These are all... It uh, will be dependent uh, upon uh, the agreement among the, the parties. Matters of the yes. Yes. Uh, In one of the case, brother, uh, you know, one corporate debtor, Earth Town Infrastructure Private Limited, an application yes, yes. under Section 7, 7. was filed mm. before you in Delhi. Yes. yes. And it was not very... Uh, uh, old it's a, uh, uh, it's, a it's a recent uh, recent, recent case recent, yeah. uh, where a, an application was filed against a company which was already struck off by roc uh, and uh, uh, under section 248 mm. and uh, you passed some judgment in that yes actually this was this was not brought to our notice by either of the parties mm. that the company is already struck off it's interesting uh, case when we looked into the documents and all that, and we just looked into okay, MCA data sheet and all that, then we found out this is already a company struck off. which is struck off. Hmm. Once a company is struck off, hmm. then the point was whether an insolvency petition can be filed against a struck off company. What is the status of a struck off company? Then we looked into the com- company law and we, we looked at uh, IBC. We tried to understand the actual thing. Yes. When a company gets struck off, it is out of the register of the ROC. Yes. So can we say it is still a corporate body? Till that time, it is not registered. That the first question. Second question was, what happens to the assets of such company? On the basis of uh, principle of uh, bona vacantia, the assets can go back to if there is nobody to hold that those assets, it will go back to the go back to the state for distribution amongst the creditors. And if something is left, then with shareholders. And if something is left, with shareholders. Mm-hmm. But whether an insolvency petition can be can be can be admi- admitted against that company, against whom are we admitting? The insolvency petition was the question. So what we passed an order telling the creditor, please file and sitting as a member of the adjudicating authority under IBC, we cannot simultaneously wear the two hats. We, we wear two hats as, as as tribunal, as NCLT under company law. We also wear the other hat of the adjudicating authority under IBC, but we can't wear it simultaneously. That is what our thought process was. That yes, if there is a 252 application, we'll decide that application. But until unless that company is restored, there's section 7 or 9 or even 10 cannot be invoked.
in a single sentence if uh, brother i can just conclude this issue uh-huh. you see you are bringing an application for resolution of the company yes. under section 7 9 or 10 uh-huh. under ibc which is on which is not even a company ha uh-huh. in the on the register of the rsc the, the, with the register of companies yes. it's a stock of company yes So you are trying to revive a company without restoration of the name of the company yes. in the register of companies yes. for resolution of the company. Uh, we we kept that judgment. We we kept that uh, application uh, in abeyance mm. till the creditors file an application under two fifty two get it restored. I will cite you a uh, a very interesting example. When we were sitting in Mumbai bench, a section nine petition came before us for. admission of the company corporate debtor into insolvency and the application was filed in 2019 we were hearing in 2020 in january or february or so and when we looked at the data we came to know that in 2016 this company against which section 9 application is coming before us for admission under crp has already been merged in 2016 with some other company now <laughs> see the beauty uh-huh. see the beauty the creditor doesn't know that, that this company, company has already been merged. merged with some other com- uh, corporate uh, company in 2016 how was the merger then no no this is either, a basic question either the creditor question. was not informed or the creditor didn't care both the things could uh, have been there uh, and uh, you know we did not go that no, ba- that, that backward yeah. and uh, you know started probing about the merger yeah. uh, how, not required. it was not required at all required. but we had to tell him that at present your section 9 application is not maintainable against a company which has already been merged yes, yes. with some other company in 2016 yes. in, and if at all you want to come for insolvency you have to file a petition against that company in which this company has been merged yes, that yes. is the position that of law as on today that's correct that is the law but you know uh, while sitting in the benches you get so many interesting yes, cases yes yes all kinds of uh, cases would come yes. and that is why that is why you are there to 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 actually separate uh, the the grains from the chaff and uh, take a view yes in one of the case brother it was db power limited versus create energy india private limited where both the parties during the process of uh, negotiation they negotiated entered into an mou by which the date of uh you know payment was staggered in next 4 5 months mm. and he defaulted in future installments mm. which was not paid in time mm. according to the revised mou or agreement mm. entered into between these two parties yes yes uh you took some decision with respect to that uh, yeah, because I... either the original date of default or the revised date of default was falling in 10a and the corporate debtor wanted to take benefit of 10a actually in the if i remember correctly the facts mm-hmm. uh, the original application when it was filed and the and the and the date which was shown as date of default was falling within 10 a period mm-hmm. therefore that application could not have been filed by virtue of the amendment uh, introduction of 10 a itself because any default falling within that period of will always remain in 20, that period and no file of no application can no application could be filed hmm. during the arguments though the the, the creditors uh, argument was that no actually we are asking for this invocation of this app, uh, the, the this application or the section 7 on the basis that we had agreed to installment payments and they have also defaulted in they have not only defaulted there originally but they also defaulted in installment payments the question that we framed in this case was whether the promise to pay later the later promise to pay can override on the previous can can can, can, can change the date of default the issue was this in our mind that whether the later promise to pay can change the date of default and uh, although one can understand that later promise to pay may, may change the date of limitation for filing the application but certainly not the date of default 
But uh, if you if you see the language of 10a, 10a very clearly uh-huh. says that if there is any default which has occurred during the 10a period, no application shall ever be no filed. No application can ever be shall filed ever for be that filed. default uh, by whatever uh, shall name ever be, you, you, they, you may put it. They have used that, that phrase, shall uh, ever be filed. Sh- sh- it can never be filed. Mm. Yes. Brother, in one of the cases, I think it was Nature India, Communic Limited, where you rejected the resolution plan on certain ground taken by the company. Yes, so one never wants to reject a resolution plan, you know. As, one, as, one, members, one <laughs> as, member, as members of uh, NCLT, we always want a resolution plan to go ahead and get implemented. But sometimes uh, some of the plans are such that uh, that don't test, uh, don't don't actually uh, stand the test of uh, law itself. In this case, if I remember, I think this is the case that you are referring to. In this case, in the plan itself, actually, I'll give you a little context. The corporate debtor was a listed company on Metro Stock Exchange. But that listing was suspended because of defaults made. It came under uh, CIRP. Resolution plan was filed by the SRA. SRA made a resolution plan asking for an arrangement of merger with SRA of this company. And in that plan itself, they put a clause saying that as soon as the merger takes place, as soon as the merger takes place under the arrangement of uh, resolution, not only this company will get merged, but automatically the SRA will become a listed company. And the suspension will also be automatically lifted, will will, will be lifted. Now, these two points uh, actually brought our attention to the issue and then we asked them to explain also as to how it is not how it is not violative of section 232.3h, small a, I think that is the provision if I remember correctly, which says that on on the basis of merger, the transferee company will not automatically get listed. It, It exactly the reverse, the law was exactly the reverse what they were seeking in the plan. Therefore, we had no other other course but to uh, to decide it against them. Brother, uh, with my experience, what I can share with you is that you know while putting such conditions in resolution plan, it can be done either knowingly or unknowingly. Unknowingly, there are very less chances. Knowingly, there are more chances. No, we gave them a, uh, we gave them a chance to explain uh-huh. as to why. And they stood their ground saying, no, 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 this is what you know, want. they think that the resolution plan once approved is by NCLT is uh, binding on all the uh, parties, mm. including SEBI, <laughs> including, <laughs> including <laughs> other authorities, including other authorities. We don't have that power. We are a, pa- we, are, we see, are a creation of the, of the that, code. That was, a, that was a, uh, um, you know, uh, basically deviation, which they, they wanted to be done through mm. the stamp of NCLT. However, they could have easily, you know, made it a point that once this company is merged into the transfer company, the transfer company will, will adhere be, to uh-huh. all the registration yes. requirements uh, which are Automa- required. Yes, they the could have done it. They could have done. But by doing that, they, they just got their uh, resolution plan yes. uh, uh, rejected. Uh, rejected. 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 We, we, with a heavy heart, we had to reject it. But... Uh, uh, but there are a few days back, I was attending an, uh, a conference the, of Triple IPI. Triple IPI, an issue which came. Now we would be discussing in general the IBC, mm-hmm. how is it is operating and all. Uh, you see, IRP, RP, and liquidator. They are very important and integral part of the, of the entire, of the entire IBC ecosystem. ecosystem. Yes. And in fact, if I say they are hub of that yes. uh, IBC ecosystem, yes. I am not wrong, wrong correct, in saying that. Correct, correct. You know, what is happening is the prospective IRP or RP or liquidator, whoever wants mm. to come into this profession, he first gets a, an examination, limited insolvency examination passed, which mm. is conducted by IBBI. Mm. Then he gets a certificate of passing that examination. Then he gets, then he goes to 
one insolvency professional agency get himself registered with that insolvency agency then he finally comes to ibbi and gets a certificate of insolvency professional from a registration certificate from mm. ibbi after that on half yearly basis rbi uh, ibbi brings out a panel of no. uh, um, which they send to us RPs, which mm. they send to adjudicating mm. authority and adjudicating, adjudicating authority uh, you know um, basically appoints the irp rp or liquidator mm. uh, from that panel yes you know what has what i have observed that for some time individual agencies like banks financial institution and other agencies they have started creating their own panels mm. Now see the irony: a resolution professional first qualifies the resolution, apply limited exams. insolvency exam, then get himself gets himself registered to trip IPA, then gets IBBI registration, then applies for panel hmm. and becomes a an IBBI empanelled uh, 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 IP. IP. Uh. And after that, he has to go hmm. X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D places to get registered. as panel uh, in the panel hmm. of that particular organization okay so don't, don't you think that it's putting somebody too much into inconveniences once the the regulator himself has created a panel why should there be a need of different panel by different organizations number 1 number 2 uh as of today the name of the rp is given by the financial creditor compulsorily mm. operational creditor uh, optionally optionally if he doesn't give then nclt appoints that yes yes you see i have seen this entire process and what my mind says that the power to appoint rp should be resting with nclt only it is still there but name is given by the creditor mm. and during this process the creditor gets uh, the uh, rp gets affiliated to the creditor whether he is a financial creditor or, or operational creditor because he is putting his name in the application in instead what we can do is that once somebody's name is there in ibbi panel there should not be any other panel number 1 number 2 all the rps irps are to be or liquid rp or liquidator are to be appointed by nclt from the panel and once the appointment is made by nclt if there is any change is required then it, the concerned for, uh, coc is to go to nclt with the reasons why they want a change in that it does happen in many cases wherever wherever we have appointed from the panel within a few months you will get applications for changing the rp and and the law is framed in such a manner that you don't need to really probe into that if they are I happy will, with that person. i will give you the uh, uh, realistic uh, 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 example even if in section 7 application the uh, the section 7 applicant hmm. has proposed one name invariably coc changes the rp because when the other lenders other make, lenders come then they, they they bring their own panel and everything uh, into picture be, which is which is delaying the entire process of crp uh, big big banks do have their own Achha. panel yes. uh, you know we have uh, in delhi and uh, i am in mumbai we have uh, handled largest benches of nclt we get a panel of about 140 or 150 people uh, in each uh, uh, delhi and bench, bombay yes. and every bench would be having 20 30 cases that's all in case the bench starts appointing one by one to everybody you know almost all rps who are in the panel they will be getting their work the work will be spread it will not be concentrated on the few few uh, rp with few uh, because, rps because and everybody will be in this system it cuts both ways because as uh, you you have rightly rightly pointed out that if the same person is getting more than 3 4 5 6 resolution he is cases, not able to he will justify. not be able to do no, justice to any of those cases it 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 is a it is a fact that in some cases we have also observed this that because of the heavy work that the rp is having or the liquidator is having he is not able to concentrate on 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 all aspect all aspects of the case 
so yes if it is more broad based it will be more uh, quicker and, and brother once let's say 2025 rp are assigned to one single bench it is in every probability everybody will be getting work from that bench yes theek hai yes. and it will be spread in that way system will be working rather than pick and choose mm-hmm. and it's a good point and uh, you see somehow i am not able to digest that the individual institutions are creating their separate panels okay. over and above the ibba panel okay, somehow so intelligent uh, this, this is this this is a news to me i didn't know that separate panels are being created for which they have to make an application the larger the bigger public sector banks are creating their own panels Yes. now where is the where is the what is the point of having an ibba panel when everybody is creating his own panel so yes. that is what is happening yeah this is a, this is a point to ponder yes this is a point that one should think about so make make the ecosystem more more broad based and more and based more, on systems more, rather than individuals uh, and more and more people will get trained then you will get better uh, quality also absolutely until absolutely. until unless the work is done by someone mm-hmm. this is a new area mm-hmm. he cannot become uh, proficient acha brother since you have recently you know demoted office about two months back or so uh, tell me that uh, according to your own assessment in last 6 7 years how ibbi has traveled till now where it is standing today and what uh, you know basically interventions you think that those are required to make it more workable and you know become the the way it is said that it is it is a game changer law so that it can work in that direction that it really becomes a game a game changer law in future also Yes, brother. As far as if you compare IBC's performance, uh, Code's performance, and CLT and CLAT, Supreme Court, the, the entire system uh, in last six years or seven years now, uh, definitely as compared to earlier laws and earlier regimes, yes, uh, there is a there is a vast, vast, vast difference. Tremendous difference. Tremendous, which we are finding. tremendous positive uh, difference. Uh, being a revenue officer. i have uh, dealt with sometimes with cases which were going to bifr and all those places and once it goes there then we thought that nothing is going to happen in this this case this has case has gone in bifr you after 20 years 25 years something will come up we don't know whether whether you will get anything out of it yes as compared to that at least ibc has brought into a sense of hope that yes within a year or two something will happen this company either will get resolved uh, creditors will get some or get liquidated uh, or get liquidated creditors will get their due to whatever extent it is possible whatever the value that the market gives of that company at least it will come back into the flow of the market and from that perspective this has been very successful as of now it is very successful but for people like you and me who wanted to succeed even further yes. we keep on thinking as to how to improve and so is ibbi because ibbi has been uh, putting discussion papers uh, being a regulator they are putting discussion papers for uh, for public to give their views on certain amendments that are getting proposed and all that and uh, i am very sure that uh, that future is uh, going to be even uh, brighter uh, for the for the for the indian economy and uh, ibc will be a, a, a one of the main stages of, uh, of of that uh, bright future uh in one of the major areas you know you you know you must have been hearing everywhere and you know nclt is criticized for that that uh, one thing one thing for which nclt is being criticized that 94% the haircut is there about 95% the haircut. haircut is there about whereas the- i must clarify it About the NC- haircut issue, NCLT has nothing to do with the ninety-four percent hair, ninety-two percent haircut or ninety-four percent haircut. It comes from the creditors. It comes from COC, yes. and it comes. It's it's a 
informed decision taken by the creditors who are secured creditors, financial creditors, and members of COC that what percentage of haircut they are ready to take. NCLT approves that. That's something different. But my NCLT's point is NCLT's approval is also due to the fact that you can't get into it. The commercial wisdom of COC is has been, supreme. Has been, and uh, NCLT has, and NCLAT cannot has get has into it. Has been declared into, to be supreme. Yes. By the Supreme Court. <coughs> by the Honorable, by Honorable Supreme, Supreme Court. Court of India. By the Honorable Supreme Court. Uh, you see, there is one area which is, you know, basically, which strikes in, uh, uh, strikes in my mind and where we need to do a standard policy framework by which, you know, what is happening is, I'll, I'll uh, cite you one example. A case came to us of from the assignee, Section 7 application against a corporate debtor, uh, where the loan was sanctioned in 1996 of the value of approximate rupees 8 crores. And today the application was 600 crores. That should be. So, compound interest. You know, compound interest. Uh, you know, I jokingly asked them, <laughs> I, I, in lighter than I asked them, whether you are compounding on daily basis, monthly basis, or minute basis, <laughs> or a second basis. You know, but the thing which I am trying to say is, that, you know, increasing your claim multiple times mm. and comparing it with the realizable value of the asset which was taken in 1996 or in uh, in the year, in uh, whatever, you know, comparing these two, the, we are comparing the uncomparables. We are, com we are comparing oranges with not apples, huh? but something else. Yes. Not even that much. Yes. Because you see, so, the claim which is admitted by the RP uh -huh. is admitted as per the book, uh, book value of the uh, claim. Uh, of the claim. He so, is not he is not allowed to go into it as whether well. whether IBA <laughs> does it, whether a Reserve Bank does it, or whether IBBI does it. Somebody has to take it on their fold and find out a way that the realistic claim is compared with the realistic value of the yes, uh, realization in the resolution plan. <coughs> Correct. If you if you if you uh, compare the uncomparable, then the results will be this like this only today, uh, ninety four percent, ninety five percent, or whatever it is. So one of the area which I am thinking for the you know uh, basically financial creditors and that two bankers who have a clear cut identification of NPA. Correct. Okay. Yes. Now the outstanding edge on the date of NPA is to be compared with the realization value rather than total outstanding including everything. Uh, including all the compound yes, interest. Yes. It's a good idea. That will give a that will give a more realistic picture of how the IBC is also working. Uh -huh. How how the system is working. Because otherwise today people say 99% you have given. You know because of this uh, uh, prudential norms. There is a clear cut uh, uh, identification of the date of NPA, yes. which is working with all banks and financial institutions yes. very beautifully. Yes. Yes. Now, if we take the <coughs> if we take the outstanding of the financial if, institution, if the claim is limited to that on the on the uh, date of NPA, uh, and then it is compared with the realizable, the things will be different. Uh, Otherwise, what is happening is on giving the claims to the RP, everything. Yes. Whatever is yes. Uh, on the earth and under the sky is put in the clay. Correct. It, it, it is happening. That is why the gap is showing so big. Yes. Otherwise, the gap would not be so seen now as so big. So now it is up to the regulators, that is IB, IBA, IBBI, or RBI, to look at it and create a policy by which realistic thing is compared with realistic, mm. not unrealistic yes. with realistic. Yes. The company's value is already down. Mm. And you keep on making your claim uh, uh, manifold, bigger and bigger and bigger. How will you rely? That is why they agree for 99%, 94%, 95% because there is no other go. The company doesn't have that value. But that gives their claim is Their claim is, as you said, the claim is so much inflated that they cannot expect. But you know, brother, what is happening is because of that, everybody is getting bad name. And NCLT, you know, is charged for that which is not the baby of NCLT. Uh, it is not. It is not. So people should understand that we do not we do not look into the haircut issue at all. We only look at what the COC has approved 
and we are bound by coc's commercial wisdom due to the fact that honorable supreme court has said that our our jurisdiction in 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 re, with reference to the commercial decision is limited we need to look at only feasibility and viability of That's the uh, resolution plan and which, to see and to see that it is not against the law huh, which that, has been restricted by yes. uh, a catena of judgment by honorable supreme court and yes. clt and nclt and, yes. uh, yes. and, and nclt that the uh, nclt cannot look into the uh, commercial, commercial wisdom commercial, commercial portion of the uh, 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 coc Obviously. whatever they have decided you cannot change it yes uh, brother with this thank you very much for coming we are coming to an end and uh, thanks for coming and sharing your valuable thoughts okay. with us thank you very thank much you. brother for giving me this opportunity to 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 express myself thank on certain you. issues that we discussed thank you thank you